Now I know that you ladies have not come here to listen to some grumpy old soldier ran on about all this blood gore or indeed medieval defensive architecture, which is a fascinating subject. You ladies have come here for the crown jewel, the bling thing. But not because you're interested in their history, you're not. You just want to make the man you're with feel inadequate. Again. And you will. Under that clock you'll find a door. When you go through it, you will see the world's largest perfect cut diamond at 531 carats. It is about the size of an egg. Do not compare your engagement rings with the star of Africa. You'll also see what is largely regarded as the world's most beautiful diamond, the Kohinoor, the light of India. We've stolen them from everywhere. <laughs> Although Her Majesty's government insists, I tell you, that they were given to us by grateful nations. Often at gunpoint, they don't let me mad. <laughs> Along this roadway to your left, you'll find the entrance to the bloody tower. You can go there, you can learn more about who may have killed those two boys, and learn also about Sir Walter Raleigh. Sir Walter Raleigh is one of my favourite characters in the story of Britain. An outstanding seaman and navigator, a great explorer and adventurer, some would say a pirate, and they're probably right. In his packed and busy life, Sir Walter Raleigh managed to spend 13 years in there as a prisoner, and he was tortured every day. They locked his wife in there with him. <laughs> oh, you, you don't need a machine to break a man. <laughs> You're going to find that out too one day. You may already have. <laughs> have you been heartbroken yet? <laughs> yeah, I suppose you have to have a heart for that, don't you? <laughs> Over here in the corner we have the Queen's House. This was built as a wedding present for Anne Boleyn. The work commenced on this in 1533, the year of the wedding, completed in 1541, five years after her execution. <laughs> now the home of the Governor of the Tower of London and his family, being guarded today by soldiers, and I do mean soldiers, of the Coldstream Guards, in their famous bearskin helmets and greatcoats today. And uh, just in case you're wondering, their heads don't go to the top either. <laughs> Two of these young soldiers have recently returned from combat operations in Afghanistan. Some of them will shortly go back there. That weapon you see is live. It is the standard British Army rifle with bayonet. Do not upset the soldiers! <laughs> Got that? Yeah. Yeah. They do deserve your respect. This is tar green. It's colour coded. It's the grass. I have to explain that because a lot of people spend an hour or so looking for a green tower. These people are Europeans. <laughs> Europeans are nice enough people, I guess, but they do have syntax problems and talk like Yoda. So, Tower Green. Grass it is. <laughs> Hopefully that's cleared that up for you. You can visit the Beecham Tower. That arched window there lets light into a chamber, the walls of which are covered with graffiti. Some of that graffiti is nearly 500 years old. Graffiti is not a new problem. Modern art is a new problem. <laughs> this monstrosity! Not you. <laughs> <laughs> Perspect granite and tubular steel is a monument to traitors and mutineers and should not exist. Traitors and mutineers should have no monuments. There are no crimes worse than treason or mutiny. I have to express that as a personal opinion. I don't know of any other nation that would mark such a historic place with such a worthless piece of tat. <laughs> this is the site of the private execution scaffold, and it was here that Henry VIII had two of his wives beheaded. Many husbands bring their wives back to admire the place. <laughs> the first of these was, of course, Queen Anne Boleyn. She was Henry VIII's second wife. His first wife was Catherine of Aragon, a Spaniard, and they were happily married for 17 years actually married for 23 years. The last six years were rather blighted by the fact that she couldn't give him a son. She'd given him a daughter, but that wasn't good enough. It rarely is. <laughs> so he divorced her, married Anne Boleyn. Like Catherine, she gave him a daughter, but she could not give him a son, and she tried hard. 
really hard, and not just with Henry. <laughs> now, I don't care what your romantic, sentimental attachment might be to the myth in your head that is Anne Boleyn. I don't care if you do have the DVD box set of the Tudors, and watch every episode back to back on a Thursday, know the script inside out because you don't have a life. <laughs> and I don't want to know if you were Anne Boleyn in a previous incarnation. On average, I meet three of you a year. You can't all be right. You are barking mad and delusional. You're not special, you're sick. Get out. Anne Boleyn should not be admired, copied or emulated in any way. She was found guilty by a court of adultery with seven men, including her brother. When you're married to the king, that's treason, and I don't care who you're married to, it is a bit excessive and not a little weird. Not for her, the block and act. On the 19th of May, 1536, as she knelt there praying for forgiveness, a Frenchman took off her head with one stroke of a two-handed sword. And it was beautiful. She didn't know she was dead. When her head was raised from the straw, the records tell us that the select audience gasped in amazement and horror that so quick had been the execution that as her severed head came up, they were horrified to see her eyes continued to gaze around at the faces in the crowd and for quite some time, whilst her neck dripped blood, her lips continued to move. But isn't that just like a woman? You know? <laughs> last word, last word. <laughs> last word. <laughs> they just don't know when to shut up, do they? <laughs> Did you think she'd take the hint? But no. <laughs> she was so convinced she was going to get a reprieve, no arrangement had been made for a funeral, and there was no coffin. Anne Boleyn, Queen of England, obviously quite a bit shorter now, had to be stuffed inside a humble arrow box. That arrow box lies inside that chapel. Under the altar, just to the left as you look at it, is the final resting place of Queen Anne Boleyn. The next day, Henry galloped off to propose to Jane Seymour. Remarkably, she said yes. And just 11 days after the execution of Anne Boleyn, they were married. Why the rush? Well, they were married on the 30th of May, 1536. In late September, just a few months later, she gave him a son. At last, Henry had what he wanted, but sadly, she only delivered half a placenta. Now, that's probably too much information, uh, but for those of you who know about these things, you will realise that she was in a bit of trouble. Before the day was out, she'd bled to death. Henry now had three children he could talk about, and no wife. In the modern era, a man might turn to the internet. <laughs> and Henry did something similar, with the same results. He had a portrait painter called Holbein tour Europe looking for likely candidates for marriage. In a town called Claver, in Germany, he painted a girl called Anne, Anne of Claver. But when the portrait was handed to Henry, he looked at it and pronounced it Anne of Cleves, and no one argued. <laughs> We've mispronounced it ever since. He fell in love with Anne of Cleves' portrait, and they were married in absentia which is not a small town near Luxembourg. It meant that neither of them were present at the ceremony. And the first time Henry VIII met his wife, they'd been married for three weeks. He met her here. He is reported to have bellowed when he saw her, my God, she looks like a horse, and not one I'd like to ride. <laughs> Holbein had made himself scarce. You see, he was an artist painted things that we don't see <laughs> in her beauty. <laughs> the marriage was annulled. Although something you might not know about Anne of Cleves, she stayed on at court, she remained Henry's good friend and confidant throughout his life and she actually ran his household right up until his death. That character. <laughs> Henry VIII's fifth wife was another matter. Her name was Catherine Howard. And academics argue over the age of this girl. Some suggest she was as young as 14. I don't buy that myself. But she was certainly no older than 17 when her father forced her to marry the king. He was now in his 50s, morbidly obese, with ulcerating wounds on his legs which stank, indicating diabetes. And in those days that couldn't be treated. He had a selection of other diseases that would have responded well to penicillin, had that been around. Diseases of a social nature. 
He had a yeoman of the bedchamber, and it was his job to lift Henry into and out of bed. He required two assistants for this purpose. No man in that condition should marry such a young girl. He really wasn't up to the task of being a newlywed husband on their wedding night. He rather embarrassed himself and he took his frustrations out on Catherine and there is some evidence to suggest that she was beaten. She felt betrayed and abandoned by her father. There was no love in the marriage. She sought love outside, she had an affair, she got caught. She admitted her adultery. But here on the scaffold, she went a stage further and proclaimed it. I die, the Queen of England, she said. I'm ready. Much rather would I have lived and died as the humble wife of the only man to have truly loved me, Thomas Culpepper. She probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Thomas Culpepper certainly thought so. <laughs> he was hanged, drawn and quartered for his part in the affair. Catherine Howard was, of course, beheaded. But then Henry did something really sick. He had quicklime put into her casket, and this dissolved her body. It turned it to sludge. It doesn't seem a big deal these days, but in Tudor Christianity, it was the belief that you needed a body in order to rise from the dead on the Day of Judgment. Henry VIII had effectively denied Catherine an afterlife, and he'd also denied God the ability to judge her. When the public found out about that, they were terrified. You shouldn't be terrified of your king. The king is there for your protection. Henry VIII had become the tyrant that Sir Thomas More had said he would be. <coughs> now Sir Thomas More was his closest friend and best advisor. They were old school chums. And when Henry VIII wanted to make himself head of church and head of state, Thomas More did his job. He advised the king. Don't do that, sir, he said. Too much power in one man shall surely lead to tyranny. And not to prove the point or anything, Henry VIII had him beheaded for saying that. 400 years later, in 1935, Sir Thomas More was made a saint of the Catholic Church. And Saint Thomas More also lies in there. Henry's final wife was Catherine Parr. She was a bit closer to his own age, she was 30. She was a widow and a skilled nurse, and that was important to Henry. It's a great comfort to me that Henry's last years were characterised by pain and that he may well have died in considerable agony. Never liked Henry VIII. Trumped up. Egotist. Can't stand it. But I know you all love him deep down. If you go inside the chapel, be advised that it is a place of worship. There is no photography allowed inside. And if you have a mobile phone, you should switch it off. If it goes off inside the chapel, God strikes you down dead with a thunderbolt. <laughs> Although my employers now insist I tell you it might not be a thunderbolt but God will get you in the end. <laughs> there is a yeoman warder on duty in there. His job is there for security to make sure you don't steal anything. He's not there to answer your questions. That is a place of quiet reflection. Got that? Yep. Okay. Well, it's all been a bit grim, hasn't it? The good news is, it's all over. Now, if you have any further questions, please feel free to ask any of my colleagues as you wonder about the tower. They'll be only too pleased to talk to you. I do mean that, especially the ones with the cage. They know the answers to everything. <laughs> now, ladies, I'm sure that you're going to go over and look at the crown jewels. <laughs> when you go to the crown jewels, there will be a bit of a queue. Your man will be stood next to you in that queue, smiling, uncomplaining. He may even engage you in small talk. One thing he won't say to you, ladies, is that he doesn't want to be there, but believe me, he doesn't want to be there. No real man wants to look at jewels. To a man, rubies, diamonds, sapphires and emeralds are just bits of compressed carbon with an element of chromium thrown in here and there. You cannot eat them, you cannot drink them. To a man, they are nothing. He is there wasting his life because you want to be there. He is there because this is what you want to do. This is selfless love. <laughs> that love should be repaid. This evening. <laughs> this evening you should take your man to a pub. There you should buy him beer. You should sit quietly and complaining, <laughs> smiling, as he watches the rugby, cricket or football. And the only words you should say are more beer, dear, 
<laughs> Would you like some nuts without you? Had some beast. <laughs> Ladies, do you understand? Yes. yes. Sure. Gentlemen, your evening is reasonably secure. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to say that's all the time I have to speak with you. But they say here you're only ever as good as your audience. Believe me, it's no fun if you stood on this block and the audience does not engage. You engage rather brilliantly today. It's a cold day, you stuck with it, you laughed in most of the right places. <laughs> it's been a real pleasure showing you around, even the people from Australia. Thank you very much. Yeah. Off you go now. Freedom. That's it. The Yoda of Mars. The Yoda of Mars. Jules! Jules! Yeah, go on. Off you go. Fly away. Yeah.